But I'm glad you're here as we're kicking off this new series that we call The End of Me. We've been planning, we've been praying, we've been preparing for it, and, and that, and, and uh, you know, we're going to be spending, today I'm introducing the series, and we're going to spend four weeks looking at how you get away, you know, with, with me, get me out of the way, and, and then the sixth week, I'm excited about what we're going to be doing on Sunday, October 6th. If you haven't heard the announcement of what we're doing, we are not having church is normal. We're not going to be the church is normal that day. Everyone we're asking to come here at 8 a.m. We've been calling, we've been emailing and talking to people. We're actually going to have a service Sunday. We've been talking with people about work projects that can be done. And so we're going to gather here Sunday, October 14th at 8 a.m. We're going to have crews that are already going to be put together and we're going to go out. We're going to serve the community that day and stuff and from 8 to noon and and then we're going to be coming back here and having a meeting in this room all of us our first service and second service people will all be together for a meal while we watch some slides uh, about all the different service crews what they did and we'll end with the worship service just praising God for what we were able to do that work we were able to do that day so where I need your help continued help and where we need your prayer is you know it's easy for me to pick up the phone and call the schools and, and call the community and say hey do you have work for us and and to talk to them, but it's real tough for me to contact all, you know, 15,000 plus <laughs> people and uh, five, 600 homes, you know, that we have in the surrounding area, plus all the homes down in Sherman and say, hey, can we help work for you? And that's, so this is where you come in. We're asking you to just literally go to your neighbors and people that you know that might need help, whether it's like coming in the house, cleaning the house, yard work that they're not able to keep up with, organizing a garage they've been trying to get to, whatever that is, talk to them. Tell them what the WCC family is going to be doing on that Sunday day the 14th and see if we can come help and then let me know because those are the projects they're all important but those are the ones we want to make sure that we also have uh, because the community the schools they can give us a list a ton of things to do and we want to serve them and be there for them but we also want to be there for the people and that so if you know that list and have that or those people please let me know as soon as you have that and uh, and that so again I'm excited about the series and you're here and as we start off today let me let me ask you to do this I'll ask a favor here. I want you to picture somebody that you know might be someone that does your hair, you know, maybe somebody at a checkout stand, maybe, you know, a family member, coworker, you know, friend. I, I don't know. Someone that you know that, that, that doesn't know Christ. I want you to just maybe close your eyes as long as you promise to stay awake. Close your eyes and just picture their face. And maybe when you close your eyes, you kind of find yourself looking at a mirror. Maybe you're the one that you're looking at saying, I'm not sure that I know who Christ is, and I'm not sure that I've given my life to Christ and the way he wants me to. But I want you to get this face. This is somebody that maybe there's some barriers that have popped up that have gotten their way from coming to Christ or is in their way for them coming to Christ. You know, maybe, you know, it's barriers like, you know, they've just had a bad past. You know, things have happened to them, and they're like, how, how can there really be a God that loves me with these things that have happened? I don't know. Maybe it's their beliefs or non-beliefs that's a barrier. Maybe a barrier is because they've had a past experience with the church and it hasn't been a positive experience. But this is a person when you think of them, you might think one of the thoughts that might go through your mind is it's going to take nothing short of a miracle for this to happen, Dave, for this person to get to know Christ, let alone give their life to Christ. That's who I want you to see. And I want you to hold that image there as we go through this series or we go through today our time together. Uh, And uh, again, um, as we do this, we learned several months ago that uh, we went through a series talking about everybody's a leader. You know, everybody who gives their life to Christ is a leader. Now, maybe you're, you don't hold a position like a pastor, or a children's pastor, youth pastor, senior pastor. Maybe you don't hold the title of an elder or deacon, but we've said that everyone that's given their life to Christ is either continuing to lead people to Christ or we're leading ourselves away from Christ. And, and what I want us to do with this series is I want us to be reminded of that as we start this off, that that's the kind of thing that Christianity is about. That's what it means to be a disciple, a follower, a leader of Christ. And I want to do that today as we're going to be taking a look at Mark chapter 2, uh, the first 12 verses. But before we, I mean, you can start turning there if you want and, and that, but before we do, uh, when I was 16 and that, I, I experienced Christ in a way I never had before. I was raised in the Catholic Church and uh, by parents, God-fearing parents, and they did a wonderful, beautiful job of teaching me that there was a God, and he had a son named Jesus. And I believe those two things in my life. I believe that there was a God, and God cared for me, and he had a son named Jesus that did great things for me. But that's kind of where it stopped, because 
I didn't know that I wanted it. And I wasn't sure what else I needed to do within my life. And I really didn't know how serious I want to get about it. Because, you know, in, in the Catholic Church, especially way back then, some of our masses were in Latin. And when you're 16, that's pretty dreary. You know, and I didn't know that I wanted to get, I couldn't get too excited about that. Didn't know if I wanted to be too excited about that, you know. And, and so I kind of had these barriers for the, the, uh, of that, of keeping me from knowing who Christ was until these two guys came into my life that started to talk to me about Jesus about God, about what he's done for us through his son, you know, and, and everything. And he started to talk, they started to talk to me about how Jesus wanted to have this, like, personal relationship, you know. Jesus wanted to spend time with little old me. Well, maybe not little old me, but, you know, wanted to spend time with me every day, helping me, blessing me, guiding me, directing me, correcting me, everything I needed. And as I listened more and more to this, I got more and more excited about this God that created everything that I knew wanted to help me. And I couldn't help but fall in love with him and give my life to him. And I did. And from that point on, that 16-year-old kid, all I wanted to do was reach out to the toughest, most unleadable people to Christ. You know, those that had a lot of barriers in the way. I wanted to just knock them all down so they can come to Christ and, and that. And sometimes, sometimes we think we encounter people, you know, that it's like, like I just said earlier, it's, it's impossible. It's going to take a miracle to get them. There's too many barriers that just can't be done. But thankfully... Also, sometimes God opens the door in our eyes and lets us realize nothing's impossible for him, and he reminds us of that. And, and literally, I've got to be honest, I had that teaching, I had that happen to me a week ago today. Every, every Sunday, we, you know, we, we go in town. My father-in-law, Gene, he's at Lewis Memorial. And so we'll take my mother-in-law and Melinda and, and, and that, and we'll go in and grab a bite to eat, and we'll go in and see Gene and spend some time with him and, and that. And, and last Sunday, you know, my phone rang. And it was a number I didn't recognize, you know. And if you're like me uh, and that, you know, I just kind of looked at it like, yeah, you know, when I see a number I don't recognize, you know, I just like, whatever, I know who it is and that kind of stuff. And unless I'm in a real ornery mood, I don't pick it up, <laughs> you know, when it comes to that aspect. But on this particular time as I looked at it, the spirit in my heart was like, no, answer this. So I picked it up and answered it. And, and, and I said, hello. And there was this voice on the other end said, is this Pastor Dave? Instantly, I knew who it was. It was a voice I hadn't heard for a couple decades, but I knew it was Jonathan Bayless. Can you believe it? And you're sitting there going, yeah, who's Jonathan Bayless? <laughs> Means nothing to you but everything to me because Jonathan Bayless was, was a kid that was in my youth group back in Iowa. Jonathan and his mom and his sister had moved, you know, she'd gone through a bad divorce, had moved to Iowa, and, and that Melinda drove his school bus and, and took him to school and kind of was talking about church. He got to meet some of the kids that came to youth group. They invited him to come to youth group, and he started when he was in junior high. And that, and Jonathan, you know, he was this kid. Uh, his nickname, unfortunately, was Buddha. Um, and, and that, and because he used to like to, in gym class at school, he'd take his shirt off and sit in his gym shorts, and he'd get in that statue pose, like, and he looked just like a little miniature Buddha. <laughs> you know, so everybody called him Buddha and stuff like that. And Jonathan, you know, he was one of those kids. If you've ever worked with junior high, you might understand this statement. He was one of those kids you didn't just want to teach about Jesus. You wanted to send him to meet Jesus. Amen. You know, and that, but I loved him to death, and I loved, and he had, like I said, tons of barriers in his life, and, and I loved having him there, even though the challenge was there with it, and then just before he got ready to go into high school, they moved out to Southern California, and I was thinking, oh, man, you know, there goes a kid that's going to enter into the penal system, you know, in Southern California, we're just going to add one more number to him, and, and I never heard until last Sunday, you know, I heard from him, and he was, you know, talking to me, telling me, I'm a minister now, Pastor Dave. He said, I, uh, he says, and he did end up in the penal system and, and there. But he said, I remembered when I was there. He says, I remember those things that I heard at youth group. I remember you saying that no matter how far I turn and no matter how far I run from God, whenever I stop and whenever I turn right back to him, he's there. I may run 10 miles, but he's right behind me. He's always with me. He's always there. And he said, in jail, I turned. And there was Jesus, and I came back and gave my life. And he says, and now I'm a minister, and tonight I get to teach to the high school kids. And I want to know if I could call you in the middle of my message, and I wanted to know if you could give a testimony of what it was like working with me. And I'm like, we ain't got enough time, Jonathan, you know, and just one night to do that. But I was like, yeah. He says, you know, how you talk and how God's word, I'm going to tell him God's word doesn't come back void. So I said, sure. And he hung up, and I thought my 16-year-old self came back and said, that's what it's about. That's what it means to follow Christ, being a Christian is about. That's what it means living, and I just got all, as you can tell, I'm still excited telling the story. It's only been a week. That's what it means to follow Christ, 
to do that and to live that way, to be that kind of leader that God wants us to be. And, and I've been reminded so many times over, uh, over the years of my life, my walk with Christ, that the kind of leadership that, that, that Jesus wants us to be, to be out there to knock down those barriers, it takes three things from us. We need to be courageous, we need to be compassionate, and we need to have a little bit of crazy in our life. If we really want to be the leaders that Jesus wants us to be, we have to have courage, compassion, and a little bit of crazy in our life. Some of us in this room have a maybe the crazy part down well, all right? <clears throat> and that, and, and I'm not going to pick on George. It wouldn't be nice if I did that. So <laughs> I told first service I was going to do that, and they just busted out like you did uh, when it came to that. And it, some of us, we have the crazy. Some of us, we have the courage. Some of us, we have the compassion. Some, we have courage and compassion, so, you know, but we have to have all three. And one of the things at Williamsville Christian Church that we are always trying to do as the leadership here is trying to remove all the unnecessary barriers that are in the way of keeping people to come to Christ. And a lot of the times when you hear that, first thing people say is, wait a minute, Dave, you're not talking about watering down the gospel, are you? Because, you know, Jesus said the gospel is a stumbling block to some people. And you can read through the scripture where Jesus, he'd be teaching to a crowd like this, and he'd say some truths that would cut straight to the heart, and they couldn't handle it, and it would thin the crowd out because it was a stumbling block. And I'm not talking, when I say unnecessary barriers, that's not what I'm talking about. The truth of the gospel of who Jesus Christ is has to always be taught and has to always be presented, and it's, it's our free will whether we accept to live by it or to go out and live our own way and not live by it and not follow it and, and that. What I'm talking about is there are men and, and women made barriers man-made barriers that are there that are unnecessary. They're, they're uh, you know, the list is as long as my arm, and we know them that's there. You know, things like rules, regulations, and rituals that man has come up and placed there that you find nowhere in Scripture. You know, there's, there's the things like programming. You know, programming can be good. Having programs can be good. But sometimes that's all people want is programs, and you can program people to death. You know, you can, you can have programs. You can have 15 programs that are outstanding and, and, and that are really good. But you're just driving people and burning people out because it's impossible to keep those up and keep going when five of them is what you should be doing and the other ten of them, no. You need to learn, you know, networking with other churches and canceling programs and saying, hey, if my brother's over here doing this, I don't need to try doing it. And this church five miles here, this, why don't we all come together and work and do it? I mean, wow, that's thinking outside of the box type of stuff. You know, that, those things are hard. can be barriers for people. You know, music, I'm not even going to touch that barrier that we get into in that struggle that's there. Toxic culture, instead of letting it affect and come inside the church, the church be in the light or, or body language. Sometimes in churches, you know, around the world, depending on, you know, it doesn't depend on the size or denomination. People can have that body language that says, yeah, when you get your life right, when you dress right, all oh, whatever, you get your life right, then you can come to Christ. And we all struggle with these unnecessary barriers because of the way we're raised, because of our background. We all have these thoughts and everything become our unnecessary barriers to get in the way. I've got them, 10 fingers pointed here. There have been times that I've known, I've seen, and I was, I've worked in my ministry, here's this unnecessary barrier that's there, and I've done nothing and said nothing. I just turned my head. Why? As I didn't want to tackle the criticism. I didn't want to be misunderstood. I didn't want to have to go through the fight, if you will, and I just let it happen. You know, when it was there, because, you know, if I mention something, well, then that's going to upset this group of people, or that's going to upset these people, and then what's going to happen? They're all going to jump. That's what's going to happen. They're all going to be scared because Dave's mad. No. You get them upset. That was perfect timing. Thanks, God. You get them, or, or Tyler, I'm not sure which one. You get them upset, and, or they get frustrated, or you try to talk, and you're scared that people are going to leave the church because you're telling them something that they need to hear, but they don't want to hear, so I'm going to leave the church in God because I don't like it or whatever, and we don't like that in church. Church is about numbers, you know, and so we don't want that aspect with it, you know, so we all struggle with that. I don't want that, and I don't want you to want that, and I don't believe you want that, so that's why I want us to look at the kind of leader that God says, remember, this is the kind of leader I want you to be, and in Mark, like I said, chapter 2, the first three verses, it says this, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. So we're at Capernaum. You know, 
Capernaum doesn't have a lot going on. They don't got the pro teams. They can sit together and watch, you know, Sunday afternoon football with it and argue over who's kneeling, who's not. You know, they don't have all the controversies that they can do over court hearings and all that great. It's just Capernaum that's going on. No Nintendo for the kids, you know, to distract them and all that kind of stuff. They just got Jesus that shows up, and Jesus packs the house, literally. You know, they're completely outside. And, and here come these, four, these five guys. You know, one of them's paralyzed. We don't know anything about these five guys. There's not a lot of detail except what's mentioned right here. We have no idea how long these five guys have known each other. I mean, they might have been the star basketball players at Capernaum High, you know, and, and the starting five on the basketball team. We don't know. Maybe the five of them one night got out. They were drag racing their camels. The one crash crippled. I don't know. We have no idea how he got paralyzed, what they came from. All we know is these four came carrying their friend, and they had two barriers in the way that could that caused them so they could not bring their friend to Jesus. And that's what we're reading here. And verse 4 says, Since they could not get into Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Now think about that for a minute. See, sometimes when these passages like this that are familiar to us, we kind of read over them so many times, we read right by it, we forget how crazy these things are. They brought their friend to Jesus. That's awesome. For some of us, that might be crazy, trying to bring somebody to Jesus. You know, They carried him in. They saw a crowd preventing them from being able to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. And plan A was what? Not plan B, not plan... Plan A, let's dig a hole and let's drop him through that. My friends, that's crazy. You get arrested, that kind of stuff. If I'm standing here preaching to you, and all of a sudden a hole comes up and somebody comes through the tile, and boom, it comes low. They're getting tased in the name of Jesus before, you know, anything happens. That's what's going to be here. But these four guys, they demonstrated a wonderful, beautiful picture of leadership. They identified an unnecessary barrier that was keeping their friend from coming to know Christ, to get to know Jesus. And yeah, they could have chose and responded to ways that might have been more made more sense they could have said well we can't get our friend to jesus so we're gonna the crowd's out here we're just gonna sit here and hopefully the crowd will thin out and and, and maybe we can get our friend into jesus then or or maybe after he's done teaching he'll come out this way and our friend will come across jesus or they could have said you know it, it's too crowded let's take our friend back and we'll try to come another day hopefully jesus will be here and there won't be such a big crowd you know all that makes sense but you know they did something a little crazy. They went through the roof. And can you imagine, can you imagine how much those four guys risk of being misunderstood? Because like all these people from Capernaum, where these guys are from, I'm sure people there with this large crowd knew them. And the criticism, can you imagine what people were saying to them as they got on the roof and started digging through somebody's house? What would you say if that was your house? Can you imagine what they took on? And I'm sure those four guys, I'm sure they had needs themselves that they wanted to bring to Jesus, you know, but they put all those aside because the need of their friend was greater. And Jesus' response to everything that was going on, in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. It was their faith, the four of them's faith, and the one had his sins forgiven. But there were two barriers, like I said. The second one was the attitude of the people in verses 6 to 8. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? So Jesus immediately calls them out for their thoughts. Because think about this. Again, he's forgiven his sins. One of the greatest gifts we could ever get is our sins forgiven. And he's getting ready to heal the guy, right? And what does he hear from the church leaders? You can't do that. You ever been involved in ministry and heard that? You can't do We've never done that way before. You can't do that. You know? Can you imagine the disappointment, the frustration, the discouragement that washed over his four friends? See, I realize, you know that your friend that I asked you to picture or the person you know that you asked you to picture or even you yourself, I realize, I realize when we're trying to stand up and minister and bring people to Christ, you know, and, and, and there's things we want to do and ways we want to do, I realize we can come under criticism. 
And when you're trying to do that, when you're trying to seem, seem to do something that's really good for the kingdom of God and, and you come under this criticism, I realize you can get highly discouraged and highly frustrated and you just want to quit. You just want to give up and say, forget it, it's over, I, I'm, I'm done with. I don't want anything to do with it. And if you've been in ministry or try to work in ministry for five minutes, you know what I'm talking about. But it doesn't just happen in the church. This happens to us all the different time. It happens to people all around. I mean, how many of you have ever been to Disney World or Disneyland? You ever been to either one of those? Yeah, or at least heard of them. And that, uh, you know, I've been to both. And, and Disneyland's the one I'm the most familiar with because in Southern California where I was a youth minister, we had a couple kids in our youth group that worked there, and they would get Melinda and I in and out for free all the time. And one time we were at Disneyland, and, and they started to do a documentary on Walt Disney. So we went in this room and started to watch it. And if you've ever learned or watched a documentary about Walt Disney, you know, things started out rough for him wasn't going so good. It wasn't until Snow White came around that that's when things really started to take off for Walt and that and everything. And when that took off and the money started coming in and, and the excitement was there, you know, he had several other programs he wanted to get going. So he hired all these different people and, and he was paying them these different pay scales because there wasn't HR back then. <laughs> there wasn't human resources to say, remember, everybody's got to start out at this pay scale or, you know, everyone works X amount of hours a week. And so he was paying them all across the board, working them all kinds of hours and the people got mad. They got frustrated and they all turned on him and Walt couldn't believe it. He got caught off guard. He got hurt. He was like, wait a minute. When this criticism started to come, he's like, wait. He couldn't believe the people. Why, why, why don't they understand my passion? Why aren't they as excited about this as I am? And so, like I just said earlier, he, he did what a lot of people want to do. He ran. He literally ran to his house, and he hid at his house. He went into his backyard, and for six months, he built a train, a little train set that he could ride. Here's a picture of him on it. Stopped over his wife's garden. That's Walt sitting on the train that he built. And after those six months, roughly six months went by, for the next couple months, he, when he'd get discouraged about the frustration, he just sat on that thing and rode it through his yard to forget about the problems of the world. And when I listened to that, I thought, wow, I love a train. <laughs> you know, if I could just escape all the fighting, complaining, and criticism and selfishness sometimes, that happens, unfortunately, because we're human in a church and just ride a train in my backyard. Even though I don't have as big as backyard it is, you know, it might be kind of slow, but if I could just do that, that'd be great. But again, to be leaders, that's not what we're called to be, to escape those things. In those moments, we're actually called to lean in and stay and engage. Because the reality is this. Anytime, anything we do to attempt to further the kingdom of God, we will come under criticism. We will face opposition that will be out there in every way. It's going to happen from the outside as well as the inside of the church because there is an enemy called Satan that hates God and anything he stands for and everything he stands for and anybody that supports him hates him too. And so that's going to be there. But the thing is this, I, I think for many of us, you know, when you're in the church and you're, you know, part of the church and giving your life and, and being a part of the church family, I think we can some, for the most part, understand the criticism and, and the frustration that comes from outside of the church. Because, you know, they're, they're, when, when people, when we don't understand something, when we're afraid of something, when we're scared, a lot of the times, what do we do in defense? We attack, do we not? And, and that just almost seems like a human response to things that we're, we're unaware of. And so we can kind of see that coming from the outside. It's when it comes from the inside, from people that we think maybe should know better, and that attack comes. Or that's where it kind of seems like to take the wind out of our sails. And, of course, the first thing we want to do is what? Attack back. You know, it makes us mad. It frustrates us, you know, and, and we get defensive and we want to lash back. But there's something we need to understand. If we're going to be the leaders and lead the way that Christ wants us to, to lead the way that these four guys did with courage, compassion, and a little bit of craziness, we have to understand this statement. It says this, Your effectiveness for Jesus can be measured by your most common response to resistance and opposition over time. Our effectiveness. How we serve Christ, how we lead for Christ can be measured by our most common, the way we respond to resistance and opposition most of the time when it comes. And what that simply means is when that resistance and criticism comes our way, you know, by people outside, but even people in the church that we feel should know better, we have the opportunity to be a powerful blessing. A powerful blessing. See, you can disarm it with patience and grace when you listen to what they're saying. Say, okay, I understand. But here's something we could never forget. You know, there are people that are outside here that are far, far away from Christ and the love of Christ and understanding that. And we have to do whatever it takes to bring them into that relationship with Christ. We have to have courage. 
the courage we could ever imagine. Compassion like we've never had compassion for people before. And we got to do a little bit of crazy stuff in ways we could never dream about it if we really want to lead these people to Christ. And that might bring criticism. And that might bring change and doing different things. You know? But that's leading the way Christ says. And in verse 9, Jesus says, Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? He's saying, this is how you're going to know that I have the authority, you know, to, to forgive sins. And all of Jesus' miracles, what they were about was him proving that he has the authority to forgive, to do, to be the son of God that he claims to be. But they also are miracles showing us that he's also come to remove all the barriers that stand in the way of people remembering, remembering and being reminded of how much God cares, that God is real, and how much he loves them and wants to be a part of their life. And when you look through scripture, the times that Jesus really gets hacked off the most of people <laughs> is when men and women re, re-erect all these barriers that he came to tear down. And so Jesus says in verses 10 and through 12, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. And that statement there at the end where it says, we have never seen anything like this. Yes, they're talking about Jesus healing this man to stand up. That's part of it. But I think they're talking about the whole picture. I think that statement means we have never seen anybody with that kind of courage of these four guys. They would have this much compassion that would cause them to do something this crazy, to open up somebody's roof, you know, and to put them in front of Jesus so we could see Jesus work in their lives this way. Because, my friends, that's what leading Christ looks like. And leading that way for Christ is what will change everything in people's lives. See, let me me come back to that person, you know, that I asked you to think about, okay? What are their barriers? What do you think are barriers that maybe that they have? And if you were saying, you know, that person I'm thinking about, Dave, is me, what are your barriers do you think are the way for you coming to know Christ? And if you're sitting there, like you said at the beginning, if you're thinking, like I said, Dave, I really think it's going to take nothing short of a miracle, you know, for them to come to know Christ. And let me ask you this. Are you that miracle? Could you be that miracle that's going to knock down that barrier or barriers or whatever it is because you're going to stand up with courage and compassion and maybe do something a little bit of crazy that's going to help them understand and know the love of Christ? You know, that paralyzed man, He didn't stand a chance to come to know Jesus if it wasn't for the courage, compassion, and that little bit of crazy from his four friends. They were willing to think outside of the box. They were willing to do something that wasn't normal and something that was out of their comfort zone. You know, earlier I said, you know, there's this, uh, I talked about the four friends that brought him in, and and the one got the sins forgiven. Not only did he get 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 the sins forgiven, but he also got healed. These four guys took the risk of criticism and everything that was going to happen. Why? So one person could be blessed and know the love of Christ and receive the blessing of Christ. Are we willing to be that courageous, that compassionate, and that crazy for the people that we have in our lives each and every day? For them to come to know, to say, hey, this is what David feels. Am I willing to get me, myself, and I out of the way so people that I have in my life each and every day can come to know the love of Christ? That's a tough thing. You've heard me say this a hundred times. But my three favorite people are who? Yeah. And when I decide to live for me, myself, and I, all I do, besides causing pain to me, is I cause pain to everybody else around because me, myself, and I... I'll confess it. You don't need my son Kyle or my son Tyler or my wife Melinda. You know, you don't need them to tell you that. I can be extremely selfish and self-centered because I like those three people, you know? And sometimes it takes, it's difficult to get it out of the way. But do we love people that much? Are we willing, you know, to be that, like I said, courageous, compassionate, you know, for the people we see every day? Or maybe are we the barriers that are keeping people? I don't know. And you might be sitting there thinking, Dave, I want to have that much compassion, that much courage, and that much craziness, but I don't know how. That's okay. We all struggle with that. But here's the good news. 
I encourage you to come over the next four weeks because that's what we're going to be talking about as we really dive into the end of me of the series is then how do I get rid of me, myself, and I? The end of me. How do I get those three guys out of the way so I can be this kind of leader that Jesus wants me to be in this world that Jesus has called me to go out and be this light to? And that's what I want to encourage you to do. The worship team is going to come up here and, and continue to sing to us Sing to us, lead us, singing to Christ, singing to God and worshiping them. But I want us to spend some time in prayer, as we always do, to take that chance and to think. Because like I said at the beginning, all of us could be in different places, you know. You know I, some of us, it, it's okay, we're comfortable. I was teasing George, you know, and, and I love the brother, you know. But I, I also know that he's willing to go out. And I know that if there are certain things that I'm going to do that some people are going to look at as a little bit of crazy, I know I can call him. He's going to stand right by my side. Actually, he might be a few steps in front of me. <laughs> you know, some of us are, some of us are good at that. Some of us were courageous. The courage part, we got down, you know. For, for the most part. Some of us were so compassionate we can sit there and, you know, we watch those little things with the little kitties on, on YouTube and we're like, oh, look at the little kitty. Other of us are like, whatever, tie it to a fan, you know, uh, when it comes to that. Some of us are a lot more compassionate. We have that when it comes to that. <laughs> Sorry if you're cat lovers and that. My wife says, don't do that in your sermon because you're going to be a barrier to people coming to know Jesus and that. But, you know, we need to be courageous. We need to be compassionate. And we need to have that little bit of craziness of those examples there. But here's the thing. We don't do it alone. Look at all these people we're corporately worshiping. You know, when we go out on the 14th, you're not going to go by yourself. We're going to go and serve as crews. When we're talking about serving in ministries, we don't do it alone. We're not called to do it alone. We're not called. You hear me all the time. We're called to do life together. Doing life together is what it is. And so where I might be a little more courageous... And maybe you need that. That's why I tell you to get with people, get involved with groups and stuff like that. Well, because maybe I need a little more crazy, so I grab somebody that's a little more crazy to help me step out of my faith and grow and mature. Maybe I need somebody that's a little more compassionate towards cats than me, you know? And so I bring that compassionate person there because I've got the courage and, and George has got the crazy. And the three of us, we go out and we can work together to do what God's called us to do as the family of God. Does that make sense? We do that. And I don't know where you are in your life and your walk, but we're going to spend some time in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. And, 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 if, and if you want prayer, if there's a decision you want to make, maybe, maybe the, the craziest thing for you right now is you think in your mind that you need the greatest courage is to say, I've never surrendered my life to Christ. I've always, these things I want to do, yeah, he's got this little part of my life, but he's not all of my life, and I really need to surrender him 100%, but I'm scared to. Maybe that's the most courageous thing you could do today is make a commitment. I don't know. Maybe the most courageous thing you could do today is come forward. I'll be up front at, at, while we're singing and ask for prayer. You know, maybe the most courageous thing that you could do is, is I, I don't know what that is. The most compassionate, whatever that is. With it. But we're going to spend time in prayer and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. And if you want to make a commitment, if you need prayer or want me to pray with you, I'll be up here. If not, if you want to talk with one of our leaders, our information's in the bulletin, you know, contact us. We love doing life together with people because that's what life is all about. So let's go before God right now. Father, I thank you. I thank you that we could be in your presence and have fun and celebrate, be reminded through song, to take the time at the table and remember the gift of your son and just to be reminded, Lord, what it means to lead for you, Father God. And I pray that we can understand that. I pray that your Holy Spirit just remind us, Heavenly Father, uh, of, of each and every day the way that you've called us to lead. I pray that you fill us with the courage we need today and the compassion we need today and that little bit of craziness that we need today to put others first, to look how we could serve them and, and how to pull alongside with our family, God, and be there and do this life together, Father God. I thank you that we have this family that we can call upon, that we can be there and celebrate life together with the Lord. And I thank you for your blessing that that's the way you created us. And I pray as your spirit searches our heart, Father God, not only will you bring that truth to us and that understanding, but you'll fill us with the strength start acting upon it. It's just not something we know in our mind, Father God, today, but we'll drop it 18 inches to our heart and we'll start living it, Father. Thank you again, Lord, for just your love, your mercy, and grace, Father. Thank you that we could be in your presence. Now just continue to hear our hearts and hear our voices as we sing out to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand.